Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza, and I am super excited about our guest today because those that know me know I'm a propeller head, truly. I love machine learning. I love the new technology. I embrace AI, everything technology. Hamza wants to know about it. So why am I excited to speak to our guest today? Because she's going to teach us the KISS principles. She's going to tell us about keeping it simple. And she's going to talk about a tried and true generational thing that I, I want to uncover because she is the award-winning author of How to Write Heartfelt Letters to Treasure. And it's going to talk about how easy it is to write a meaningful letter of appreciation. So whereas spoken words, text, and emails are fleeting, a gratitude letter is tangible and long-lasting. It is a world-changing to its recipient, of course. And I'd love to know more about that because how can this tech geek love something so tried and true? Our author, Lynette Smith, will lead us in that direction. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lynette to the podcast. Welcome. Hi there. How are you, Hamza? I am doing quite well. How are you? Just doing fabulous. fabulous. The weather's gorgeous out here here in Southern Cal. Cal. Yeah, they say it never rains in Southern Cal. (laughs) You had some fires earlier, but I think that is a, a thing of the past now. I think most, I think of, them most are, of them are, not all. Not all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing that I did like is you just said, hello, how are you doing? And I was like, that is so novel. And I was just wondering if people did that for social media. I know that for the most part, people, <laughs> they don't even roll out of bed before they pick up their phone, and you just <laughs> jump into the fray. But you change <laughs> someone's frequency just by asking, hello, how are you? And, and you don't want to know what's weirder is that, is that uh, I, I, wait oh, for an I, I wait for an answer. Mm. Not everybody, hmm. does, Not everybody that. does that. If you wait for an answer, that means that you don't just keep talking to the wall, which could be social media. Uh-huh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it takes two. But if you're just constantly venting, you're not waiting for the other person to respond. That speaks so, volumes with so, it. I know. Somebody I know. once somebody told, once me, a very told wise me a very person wise person said, said we have two we have ears, two and, ears one and, and one, one for mouth a reason. for a reason. <laughs> listen, wow. Listen. You know, in, in the intro, I was talking about getting back to basics and the KISS principle. And it it kind of hurts for me to say it, even though it's very humbling that there were generations or civilizations that were very, very technologically advanced in the past that are no longer here. So at some point, I think we're always brought back to the basics. Yes, and yes, interestingly, and interestingly within, in this time of, this COVID, time of COVID and isolation, and isolation how, how uh, we, I, we we want to write we these letters. Write these I, letters. This, is I, this is a wonderful opportunity, opportunity to do that. To do that. And, uh, and uh, I'm here to tell you how. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm just also thinking, and this is a, an, another old story. I'm sure you've heard it a million times. Uh, but when we were talking about social media and you're waiting for someone to respond, uh, sometimes you see that it, it's not a luxury to keep responding without hearing the other person and you might type something that you're going to regret, whereas if I'm writing a letter and I put it in a mailbox, I still have time to go and grab it and rip it up and uh, save myself from a lot of uncomfortableness. Yes. You know, these yeah. days we these days actually, actually uh, create a, 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 a draft. A you, can, draft. You, can draft you can draft a letter, draft on, a a letter on a computer, and then you can always and handwrite it or just print it out print or, it out whatever, or from whatever from the computer. From the computer. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. David, I want to ask you if my voice is coming through clearly because I'm hearing quite an echo of my own voice. Are you really? Because you sound fine on my end. Okay, well, I'll try to keep up and not be distracted by that echo. Your voice okay. is fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you said draft a letter. Um, 
before I, I get into the, the specifics of how to write heartfelt letters to treasure, what, the, what brought you to actually writing the book? I know that you have a publishing house and you are an author by trade, but did you wake up and when you went to elementary school, they asked what you wanted to be when you grow up? Did you knew, know you wanted to be an author? No, absolutely not. But <laughs> the, in my, my career is copy editing and proofreading of book manuscripts and book layouts, whereas uh, my life purpose is to show people how and why to write these heartfelt letters of appreciation. And that part has a backstory, and it's a wonderful backstory. In 2008, in late November, our son got married, and we were attending the rehearsal dinner, and it was uh, quite a surprise, a happy surprise to us when our son and his bride-to-be each came out holding a framed letter of appreciation to their respective parents. And they had their best man and maid of honor read those letters aloud while they stood by their own parents. And these letters were just so moving. They talked about what it was like growing up in the family, what what were the traits they most admired about each of their parents, their parents, and also. And also uh, the values the they, value learned, they, they learned that they to planned to bring to, bring their, to marriage. their marriage. And it was so and moving was so that there moving wasn't a dry, wasn't a dry eye, eye in, the in the house. More than that, More than that uh, we've got these, uh, we've got this letter of ours, letter of ours and, and every and time, every I, time read it, I read it, I feel just, I feel as, moved just as moved as the first, as the time. first time. And so it has that, so that lasting value. value. And it's not and like it's not texting, texting or, spoken or spoken things or any of that. Any of it's that. much it's more long-lasting. Long so uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps why, why it's, important it's important to get these things in writing. writing. I love it. And I was dabbling in doing genealogy research around 2008. And 2020 has taken it to the next level. One, because of the technology, it's just easier to kind of find your fifth and sixth generation family. Uh, but one thing that that is difficult to find are like pictures and letters. You know, it, it will be interesting if we had letters. I know that, um, like many people, their family reunions were canceled this year due to COVID. And, you know, prior to getting ready, you know, it's always important to at least get down on, on at least from an audio sense, getting the matriarchs and patriarchs story, like what did it feel like going through, blah, blah, fill in the blank. And it's just so pertinent when we are reading a letter because you actually get a bird's eye view into what they were thinking at that time because I'm with them at that point, you know, you're writing and you, like you said, you're drafting. So you're editing and this doesn't sound right. Or maybe, you know, if I tweak this, this will come across differently. And you kind of get a, a thought process behind the person writing that letter. That's true. That's indeed. True. Interestingly, Interestingly uh, a couple of years, couple ago, of years ago, ago, we came across my father-in-law's mother's, mother's diary. diary. She had two she of them, one from, the, from about 1913 to 1915, and the other one was 1938 to 1939. And in that earlier one, she wasn't yet married, but at, later on in the diary, she was dating the person who eventually became her husband. Well, he was in the Army, and this was around the time of World War I, and she had tucked a letter into that diary that she wrote to herself just talking about the fact that the next day she was planning to hear whether he was going to be ship, shipped off to France to be in the trenches, and she was so concerned and so beside herself. She poured out her heart in that letter, and that's, that's what you're talking about is getting that kind of thought into writing. Mm -hmm. And I like the point that you said that you, she wrote to herself because mm -hmm. how important – 
do we, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of psychological benefits to it because it's what's my frame of mind as I'm writing this and as, I, as I'm just writing it out without editing, I think I'll get an expert's opinion from you that it's good to just have the stream of thought and then go back and edit. If you're constantly editing the first, second sentence, you'll never get that full thought process out. Is that the case? That is the case, and that's why so many people journal. They just need to pour their thoughts out onto paper in a free-flowing manner. And that's what she was doing. She did line through a couple of things and keep things writing, keep but writing, basically, but it, basically was it was a flow of thoughts of and thought what her concerns, concerns were. were. Mm-hmm. And when you're talking about paper, again, from a technological standpoint, it can't be hacked for the most part unless, you know, you have a, a – a sibling that you have the sibling rivalry with when you're a little kid and you sneak and steal their diary, but it's not hacked if it's in the cloud or, you know, on your computer. It's it's easier to um, be private, I would believe. It's very, very private. very, very private. Interestingly, interestingly, that that prompts something else. else. The idea idea that that you can write a letter to a departed departed loved one and, and pour out your pour thoughts out your that, thoughts might, be that extremely might be extremely private that you private never, that want, anyone never want anyone else to see or read, read. You, can you can create that create letter, that letter read, it read it aloud in some, in some kind of a special, special environment, environment like uh, by a like mountain a, stream a mountain or stream at the beach at, the at sunset. Beach sunset but then but that then original that letter that is meant for nobody's eyes but yours can be either shredded and floated downstream burnt, buried we have the choice have of the making choice sure it remains sure invisible to the rest of the world. Mm. It, it makes me think of, I think it was the first time that I did it was in middle school, in the middle 80s, and we did those time capsules. So it sounds like one of those where you put your, your most precious items and someone may uh, our thought process behind it was 2000 was coming <laughs> and then with the world. It's funny to even think about it today, but would the world end by 2000 and, and what would it look like? And will they see that we played Pac-Man and that was the best thing in the, in the world? <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, I know. So interestingly, um, interestingly remember the old term, the old term chess? chess? Okay. People, you know, People, girls in particular, girls, when they were when they probably were preteeners, pre-teeners, would start would putting start things putting away in their away hope chest that were treasures to, to them or that or they that felt they would do them good when they grew up and get married. Um, um, I, have an, I have a hope chest today that I received when I was in about the sixth grade, and in it are a few of those letters. That's a good place to store those letters. That, that becomes our time capsule in a sense. The other day, I, I found something in there, and I went, oh, that harkens back to seventh grade. We used to take gum wrappers and, and fold them up in a certain way and make something called love chains out of them. And the idea at the time was they were supposed to be the height of the of the boy you had the crush on, and mm-hmm. and so that you had this long chain made out of gum wrappers, and I had saved my love chain, which I used exclusively Wrigley Spearmint gum wrappers, so it would look really cool, and that was in my time capsule called my hope chest. It's funny, I brought it out, took a picture of it. Put it on social media, Facebook, uh, on our alumni group for the year I graduated from high school. I said, anybody else remember these? Anybody still still have one? What a kick. What a kick. That got so much engagement. engagement. (laughs) I'm I'm so sure. Um, Well, I guess my first question is if you put it on Facebook. Johnny, that was so dreamy in first grade, oh, oh. <laughs> was, did he respond? Did those guys respond? And where are they nah, now? Nah. The, the guy who, the, the who, guy I, was who I was trying to make the love chain the right, chain height, the right for, height for, I never, I lost never, track, of, I him lost track of him by the time I was in high school. school. I don't, high school. Know, where I don't know where he went. And you know, I don't much mm-hmm. care. I don't much care. They're still there. They're still there. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to give you a 1-800 number if you were still pining for him. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm, now, happily I'm happily married, married now. now. Yes, yeah, so take that, Johnny. 
<laughs> I want to ask you because I'm not really familiar with the Hope Chest, and it sounds like it was the precursor to the popularized version of Law of Attraction, where you put these things out to the universe, let them go, like you said, you didn't have an attachment, and then you get the desired in, uh, outcome, or you get better because you didn't have the, the said attachment. Well, no, unfortunately, that, that would be very cool, but, but this was actually just a place that was lined in cedar so bugs and such wouldn't get at the contents. And if you had your, your embroidered pillowcases and so on and so forth, you would put those kinds of things in there to save for when you got married. So it's just, it's just a, it's like a blanket chest is the way it appears on the outside, but it's lined in cedar and you put these cool things in it that you want to save. Now, one thing that I like about it, but I guess the trepidation that comes from my next question, as I'm sure in this, <laughs> no offense to anyone, but guys don't, we're not known for writing hope chests. We're not even known for writing letters. So how do you get the, the general male public to be interested in even going down this path of writing a letter? Well, funny thing, of course, my son was the impetus for all of this whole idea of writing letters, at least in my life, and he's a guy. He told me one time, he said he, he talked to his fiance about things they wanted to do that would be nice for their parents, but they didn't have a lot of money, and they couldn't figure out what to do, and then he came up with this idea of writing the letters, and she said, okay, so they pursued that, and he is a pretty decent writer. He didn't do a lot of schooling after high school, but he's a pretty decent writer. He's a very thoughtful person. He puts his thoughts into writing very nicely. And he really had the right formula there, formula there for writing one of these letters, and he came up with it. And I'd like to share that right now, if I may, because for almost any type of letter of appreciation, you can follow this formula and make it easy to write. Interested? I love it. Let's go for it. All righty. In the first paragraph, you just, just talk about, talk a, shared about a shared memory, memory you and the that you and the person you're writing to treasure. both treasure. And then in the, and second, then in the paragraph, second paragraph, you highlight, you highlight some, of some of the qualities that you find, that you find most, find admirable, most admirable, admirable about the person about the you're writing person to. You're writing to. And, you don't have and you don't have to. Get a great big, get a long, great big laundry long laundry list. list. Focus, just on focus on maybe three, three things, or, things five or five things. If you want, if you, want you can want, give you examples of how you saw those you traits, saw those in, traits action. in action. If some come, if to, some mind. come to mind, and once you've and done once that, you've done progress that, on to another on paragraph where you talk about the difference this person has made in your own life or in the lives of others. Because you might be writing to a public figure, and let's say a volunteer in a charitable organization, and so you talk about the positive about the difference positive that they've made in, in your life or in the your lives, life of the lives of others. And then you progress, then you progress to the last to paragraph, the last paragraph where, where you just simply just say simply thank you thank for who you are, you are in, in, your in your own words, and then you hand then sign then it. Hand that sign is it. That's, that's how hard that's it is, hard and it's it not hard. It's not hard. Not at all. I mean, for the template, for sure. Uh, templates are awesome. They are ideal. And thanks for the clarification because you just taught me another nice fa basic foundation that you should never assume because I thought your your son's fiance at the time was the one that put him up to writing the letters. Nope, I found, nope, out, I differently. found out differently. And, and here's and, another and here's one that's going to surprise the heck out of you. I was on a Zoom meeting yesterday with some fellow editors, and in the course of it, we were talking about editing poetry, and one of the persons there who does edit poetry said, surprisingly, most of the poetry that comes to her for editing comes from men, not women. My gosh, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Wow. Okay. I love it. I love it. I don't claim to know everything. <laughs> you were just kind of blowing my mind here. <laughs> yeah. Well, my mind got blown when I learned that yesterday. So I, I guess, you know, every day you have to get ready for a mind-blowing revelation somewhere, somewhere along the line. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Makes life an and adventure, doesn't it? 
Well, it, it puts another feather in our cap because the the general this is a generalization again that we're not as in tune with our feelings and such, you know. But this is an avenue that if you're writing it down, that our significant other would definitely appreciate it. Sure. Well, interestingly, as far as men's thinking and women's thinking, this is pretty well generally known, but one comedian summarized it. Uh, I mean, men are linear thinkers, and that, that's pretty much a given. They're not, their minds are not going all over the place. They're thinking about one thing at a time, typically. Women, as was typified by this comedian, tend to have spaghetti brains, and that's how their thoughts go. They're all over the place, and so the next thing that comes out of a woman's mouth to a to a male listener is going, where did that come from? And he has no idea all the the convoluted path that she went through before she came out with that thought, but that's because her mind is all over the place. place. (laughs) (laughs) These opinions do not reflect. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, know, talking with my husband, husband, uh, I'll I'll say something out of the the blue, and I said, oh, sorry about that, spaghetti brain. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> too funny too funny uh i do want to i want to uh, stay topical for a second in um sure. Sure. current events because um over the weekend you know we have to say rest in peace to um, um chadwick boseman who is a famous actor who's done many movies oh, uh, oh, which i'm a big was, fan i'm a big I fan love the marvel, I love the marvel movies, movies. Yes, and, you know, there's tons of outpouring of love internationally. And one video, there are a couple of videos that I do want to cover, but uh, one was, uh, he was, uh, they had a poster, I think the movie had just come out, and people were speaking to the poster. They were saying, we're going to record this video and send it to, you know, the Black Panther cast. And so people are speaking to this this photo of, you know, Black Panther, and he's at the front and all this. And then after they say their piece, I guess they had a minute, he would come out and surprise them with Jimmy Fallon. And everybody, it was just so cool to see. But, you know, now with um, what I've seen with, with others like popular celebrities and what have you, the world is moving so fast that we grieve, but it seems like there's a short time frame. And then there's something else that goes in the news that distracts us and then we forget about it. Whereas if we were to write a letter of appreciation, I think it would last a lot longer. It would indeed. It would indeed. And, and I can tell you I that, when, tell you that when, when somebody, when a somebody friend or a family passes, or family passes, away, passes away, I'm not just I'm sending not a just sympathy, sympathy card, card to, to, to with their family their member. Family I'm, member I'm, I'm, I'm putting I'm a rather a long rather note long inside that sympathy, inside card. sympathy card. And once or and twice, once or I've, twice tucked I've tucked in a letter because if this person was really close to me and made a big difference, I want them to know how much that how person much meant to me so that they so have a greater have appreciation, appreciation for their loved one. And uh, the other day, somebody I had done that for actually wrote me a letter back because she's going through the process of grieving for her father. And there's a lot going on with the grieving, especially with the social isolation and everything else. And she talks about what's difficult and what's, uh, you know, what brings her closer to her dad at this time and everything she's going through. So people need to connect on some level. And I think that the words I wrote to her in the sympathy card brought out, it, they acted as an invitation to her to write back and pour out her own heartfelt feelings. And that's healing for everybody. Mm-hmm. But prior to 2020, I, I the way I interpret what you just said was the law of reciprocation. Like when you receive this heartfelt letter, do you find that it's usually reciprocated in kind uh, because you've touched something that someone may not have thought you would do maybe? I think that uh, what you focus on expands. And if you're Mm -hmm. writing that letter, uh, the person who's receiving it doesn't necessarily feel required to write back, but feels moved to write to someone else whom they appreciate. And I think that pay it forward idea is the one that, that comes through here. Mm-hmm. So that's and really I, great. Yeah, I think that's even better. I, I love the fact, I, I think we're talking about no attachment. And so 
it, this is how you felt. It didn't necessarily say I'm eliciting a response from you, and then right. they pass it forward. So, um, right. With, Much by that same Much by that same token, I was having a conversation recently about this. We're going through a global phenomenon, right? And so, oh, yes. right, to say the least, I mean, it's such an understatement. But every country is responding to it differently. I mean, not to, we're not going to do politics at all, but from a writing letter standpoint and expressing gratitude, do you think that would be something to catch on of sharing stories in different countries to get a viewpoint of what we're going through? Because <laughs> as I'm asking this question, each state in this country is experiencing it differently. So where would the letter of gratitude come in? Um, would that be something viable, do you think? Huh, interesting idea. You know, if, if there's going to be some central receiving point for letters like this, I don't know what it would be, but wouldn't it be wonderful to have them all put in that giant bucket, whatever it is, or, you know, hope chest, or time cap, time cap, time cap. Time cap. Yeah, yeah, you could do you that, could do and, that. And, and it would be, it would be again, again, points of view points from, of all, countries from all countries in the world, in the from, world all from all individuals in the world, in the world or regions, to see how to this, see how this, this whole, whole, how whole, this is affecting them. them. I think that, I think would, be that would be phenomenal, but I just, but I just can't, rip, can't wrap, my head around wrap my head around where, where that central, that central receiving, receiving point would be. be. But I think there's but certainly think there's merit to just merit to writing just the letters, the letters. And keeping and them as a permanent, as a permanent record, record even within record your own family. Your own family. You, could you could talk about what is, about what is happening, happening in your own, in environment. own environment. And then in the wider, in the wider you, know, you could contrast it with what's happening with different states, different states and then with and different then countries. With different and countries. I think that would think be that would a be wonderful, wonderful legacy to legacy leave to for, time, for time somehow. It's somehow. just like the World like War II letters, letters. gathering those together. together. I think that's a really neat idea. Got to think how that could happen. Sure, because uh, from a from a technological standpoint, I have family across the world. So when we've been doing the zooms, like what's going on there? What's going on there? You know? Sure. And it's sure. night and day. It's like what? Like <laughs> what you consider normal is as has been expanded like crazy. And I was talking earlier about the genealogy. So I was speaking to like a third cousin, if you will, and so we were, you know, lamenting their family reunion was canceled, ours was canceled. And they said that our, our, ours, you know, God willing, will be next year. And they, in the conversation, they said that they're waiting until 2022 because when the pandemic hit in 1918, it was roughly two years before things kind of normalized. And, yeah, so it was just really interesting to get other people's opinion when you speak because, like you said, you wait for a response. And if you don't get that response, your thinking is in a vacuum. Right. right. Talking about Talking postponing, about postponing things, things into the things future, future. My husband and I my were planning to take a bucket list trip, trip, trip to Australia to and New Zealand early, Zealand early next, next year. year. And we decided, mm -hmm. we decided a couple of weeks couple ago weeks that would be a little, little, little premature, so we're bumping, so bumping it by a year. Same thing, 2022. 2022. Um, yeah. I, I, you just, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting time, time where we time can't time tell what tomorrow is going to be like, and we can't do long-term planning. And so we just have to say, well, this is today, let me make the most of it. And this is tomorrow, let me make the most of that. But you dare not plan too far into the future beyond that, because you simply don't know. It's so mm -hmm. weird. Mm -hmm. I think that's where uh, initially I was thinking, oh, a letter, right? Like from a Hollywood standpoint where I write a letter, the person receives it, and then we ride off into the sunset. But as you were mentioning, we can't go too far in the future in writing uh, because we the future is unknown. So are you also suggesting that these letters be um, – series, if you will, and if they are, do you find in, in this journal writing that it could be, you may find patterns, like every three months I'm thinking this one thing, or are you seeing any type of, uh, not data, but I guess it's a rough question because it is so individualized, but do you find yourself revisiting themes if you're writing it out? 
Well, I don't know. You're right. It's a rough question. As you were talking, I was trying to imagine the best scenario might be from an individual standpoint. If I were inclined to write about what it's like to live in these unprecedented times, I'm so tired of that expression, I can't tell you. <laughs> but um, I would. I think it would be good to write, to write, let's say, once a month. And, and as a journal, more than anything else, write a journal of what I'm experiencing, what people around me are experiencing during the pandemic right now. And then a month from now, how has that perspective changed? And a month from then, how has it changed? I think that would be a nice progression of documenting this whole experience. Mm -hmm. uh, with that being said, that um, I, I was talking earlier about rolling out of the bed and picking up your phone and what have you. And when we're writing letters, there's – not everybody, another generalization. There's usually some type of electronic <laughs> distraction going on, be it the TV, the television, social media beeps on your notifications on your phone. Are you saying, or would you suggest, or what's the best return on writing with the noise in the background versus setting aside some time where it's quite your quiet time to, to kind of massage and go through your thoughts? Absolutely, it ought to be quiet time. Take away the distractions. Get in a quiet place, wherever that needs to be. Turn off the distractions. You may not even want music, but if you do have music, make it non-vocal music so that you don't have words in the background that are interfering with the words in your mind and the words you want to put on paper. Just get to a quiet place and think and write. And that's the best way to compose what you want. And spaghetti and brain spaghetti here is thinking of other thoughts, as, I, as she's as saying. I, as this she's saying this one, she's thinking, she's thinking a, lot a lot of people are reluctant to put things. To put things they, they're they're they, reluctant they're, they're to try reluctant to, to put things, things in writing. They don't, writing. See, they don't, they don't feel they, they don't have, feel the they have for the doing knack that. for doing that. They get all caught, get up, all in caught up in their own words, and they just and can't, they just move, can't that move that letter that forward. Letter forward. Um, um, I would like to strongly like recommend to, strongly to people, recommend like, people that. like that. Pretend the person Pretend you're writing to is just sitting across the table from you and talk on paper. On paper. Record it. Okay, record use your it. technology. Okay, technology. Grab it out Grab and record, it out and yourself, record yourself speaking to that person, that person saying what you'd like to say. Like to say. Then take what then you've take said what and put it in writing and clean it, 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 it up a little bit. Polish it a little bit. You know, along those lines, I'd like to share there's a very useful website out there that will take your MP3 recording and transcribe it for you eventually into a Microsoft Word document. And it's so cost effective you wouldn't believe it. I think it's 20 cents per audio minute right now. So if you speak for 15 minutes, it's going to cost you $3 to get this transcription. It's a real killer. The website is temi.com. T like Tom, E, M like Mary, I, dot com. And I experienced that when I found an audio cassette of my grandmother's voice speaking to my son when he was only a toddler back in 1982 and 83. She left this for each one of her uh, grandchildren at the time, her great great grandchildren. And uh, it was really, really moving. And, and I was able to have my husband convert that to an MP3 and then upload it to Tammy.com. And in only five minutes after I uploaded it, there was a transcript on screen for me to look at. And it was so cool. I was able to hear my grandmother's voice, and it would highlight each word on the transcript as she was speaking it. And if I saw that it got something wrong, I could pause it, go and fix it, and then replay it from any word I saw on that screen so we could backtrack a little. And in that way, I was able to clean it up. And when I got done, I downloaded it, and it became a Microsoft Word document, and I can do with it what I wanted. What a cool idea. Nice way to write a letter. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm a big fan, and I'll, I'll definitely wave the flag for that. I was using Timmy. I'm, I'm using a competitor now, but it's so inexpensive to do it. Right. And it's uh, the way I would 
the way I would phrase it, I have to give a shout out to one of my cousins who uh, started school this year or college, and I was talking about how <laughs> in the dinosaur days that we would write a 500 word essay in like 30 font and like triple spaced and what have you. Mm -hmm. And now, um, and back then, and like even in the early 2000s, how rough it was to use something like a dragon naturally speaking. And, and it's so effortless now to kind of get your thoughts out there. And again, like you said, you get that stream of consciousness out there and then you can edit afterwards and you realize how much you've gotten done. Yeah. Yeah, but people who think they can't write, they do know how to talk. So that's mm -hmm. all they have to do is pretend they're speaking to this person they're grateful to, say the things they're grateful about, and then then transcribe it, clean it up, go for it. Mm -hmm. So if we – I want to talk about having the dam, the water dam breaking and this total growing to something that we could never imagine. So your first – intro to this was your son doing this letter and then how soon do you and for the person that now knows they can get things transcribed how soon is it to take a leap to express gratitude to all the people in your life i know that when i see just out and probably pre-covid since i'm not out anymore but um, seeing a veteran with their hat on or some type of uh, shirt or what have you out you know thank you for your service and they would beam so you can this can not be a full time job, but you can express gratitude to every person in your life, can't you? You absolutely can. And I'd like to suggest too that during this time and honestly with the the mortality rate with the COVID virus, especially amongst the old or the medically challenged so we don't know that those people are going to be here with us long term, and maybe they're the ones that need to hear right now that they are appreciated. Don't you think? Don't you think? Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And I would think, right? If it, I mean, we don't know what their situation is. That it may be that uh, I call it multiple multiple modalities. So if you wrote them that letter or sent them that. MP I don't know if they would have an MP3, but if they had something that they can hear that audio, I know that, um, like, my mom loves hearing her grandkids or great-grandkids and just hearing their voices, you know, you get really sure, excited. Sure, So, yeah. Yeah, and I, I yeah, agree and with I, that I agree because, that that's, because that's, in my book, in my book I've mentioned, I've mentioned that, that once you've written once your letter, written that's, your that's letter, the thing that's tangible, that's tangible that doesn't get lost, doesn't with, get lost time. with time. Uh, but you can also but you record, can also it, record it. And Here's yeah, an interesting here's an idea. Interesting idea. idea. Let's suppose let's suppose you, uh, this is somebody who's married to a military, military service member who's stationed, stationed overseas, and they want, yeah, to, write they want to write a letter to that military, military, military member, member expressing gratitude, expressing and gratitude. they can do that. They can do that. But, they can but they can also send a recording of their voice, of their voice and yeah. reading yeah. that letter. So that even letter. if you yes. want to say to that person you're writing to, I've written you this wonderful letter, and I'm reading it to you now, but I'll save that letter for when you return. Return. That's another way That's to get that into the multi-modalities that you're talking about, and I think it's excellent. It's excellent. You can do a video the same way. Uh, sometimes with a video, you can throw in pictures. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Nothing to do with the letters, but I do have an interesting story about when my dad passed away back in 2007. Would you like to hear it? I think it's helpful. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, he passed away Christmas Eve of 2007. Now, we had a tradition every Thanksgiving. He lived about 30 miles away. We would go pick him up Thanksgiving morning, and he'd spend the day with us on Thanksgiving, and then spend the night that night, and we'd take him back home the next morning. This time, by prearrangement, we asked if he could also, while he was here, tell us some of those stories that he always used to tell that we just found, you know, endearing about different aspects of his life. And he said, sure. And I said, could we record them? Yeah. Well, our son was here in town at the time, and so he and I were the audience for my dad as he told these stories. 
And we had a list of, I believe it was 11 things that we wanted him to tell stories about. So he'd stop and uh, say, okay, let me think for just a minute now. And he'd say, okay, I'm ready. And then I would turn on the little MP3 recording device. And when I saw the counter start to advance, I'd say, okay, Daddy, you can talk now. And he would tell his story nice and cohesively. And then he'd say, he'd pull a forest gump and he'd say, well, that's about all I know to say about that. And that was my signal to turn off the recording. So mm-hmm. we ended up with 11 nice recordings like this. And then he says, so anything else you guys want to know about while I'm here? Mm-hmm. And my son, my blessed son, once again came to the rescue. And he, said, he said, well, Granddad, I've always wondered how you met and married Grandma. Mm-hmm. Well, what an idea. And so my dad thought for a minute, and he said, oh, and you know, because I didn't even know all that much about that story. And I can't believe I'd never thought to ask. And my mom was deceased already by, by about 15 years. And so my dad told that story, and that became our even dozen stories. Now, as far as that went, that's wonderful. But then he died a month later. <laughs> We had his life celebration the following March 1st, and my husband, who's a bit of a techie, rigged up some things in the American Legion Hall where we had this celebration. In the back of the room, he took seven of those recordings that were most likely to be of interest to people who were there, and he set them up so there was a title to each of the stories on screen at a small desktop computer, and he had three or four chairs sitting around there. Around there. And and, and a person could, and the person take, could the mouse, take the mouse and click on the story they wanted to hear, and they could hear it being told in my dad's own voice. My dad's own voice. And, while and while it was while being told, it was being told there, there was a black and white black picture and white on screen that had screen something had to do with that, to do story. With that story. And then when and the then story when finished the story being told, finished it would go told, back to that back menu of seven choices again. again. And that was really that cool. Was really cool. Mm. But then at the then front, at the front on the stage with the big screen, the big my screen, husband my also husband set up a slideshow of slide photos show of my dad and my mom through time. And he had that looping through while my dad told that story as part, part of our part regular of our program regular when we had program the program had part, program of part of it. And that and was that so was meaningful. So and if we hadn't gotten those stories gotten written down or, you know, spoken, you know, in, the spoken in the first place, place mm-hmm. we wouldn't have had these experiences to share with others. What a great way to pass on legacy. Yeah, I actually shed a tear for a brief second. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my favorite guy in the whole world, uh, my grandfather and it made me think of, uh, I, I brought a couple of nice young ladies home to meet the grandparents and all that to get their approval. They're the, they were that front line, you know, that final frontier oh, yeah. to, oh, yeah. with the blessing. Oh, yeah. And I remember I was in, um, in Toronto for an I Can Do It conference. And I ran, I, this person just seems so different, right? I guess there's always that one. And I was just like, who is she? I'm moving. I never thought of moving outside the country or anything. And the first person I called, even from Canada, it was my grandfather. I was like, what was it like when you met grandma? Because I've never felt this before. And as you were sharing that, if I had an audio to listen to that, that, that would be great to listen to oh, sometimes. Oh, yeah. That's making me yeah. shed a tear. <laughs> well, this, this recording of my grandmother's that was intended for our son, she gave that to me back when, you know, in the early 80s. And she said, now you save this for when he grows up to be a young man. And I put it in my nightstand drawer. We changed bedroom furniture a couple of years ago. And when I was moving things from one nightstand to the other, I found this, this tape and I went, oh, Darn, I forgot to give that to Byron. Mm. Oh, what now? And <laughs> so, you know, we changed it to the MP3 recording. We also got the transcription through Tammy.com. And we shared those things with our son at that time. Now, in hindsight, this turned out to be the perfect timing. If we had given that audio cassette to him then, number one, he didn't have an audio cassette player. Number two, he would have lost it over time, and you know, because he was young. 
there, mm-hmm. that was the wrong time to give it to him. The right time was now that he was nearly 40, <laughs> has two daughters <laughs> of his own, and mm-hmm. could identify with all of this and remember his grandmother again through her voice. And we also gave him the transcription. He was able to uh, have his grandmother, his great-grandmother, speak, you know, he, he heard that recording, he played that recording, and his own daughters got to hear that. They got to hear the voice of their great-great-grandmother. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, Absolutely. So very cool. Yeah, it, well, I, I guess we're going to go into technology a little bit now, because as you were saying that, I originally thought of, of Spike Jones, and Spike Jones is... <laughs> Right? I think you know where this is going. Yeah, so, I know Spike Jones. <laughs> so he wrote, he did the movie Her that everyone loved. And then um, after Her, I can't remember the name of the movie. I was trying to bring it up um, as you were talking. But it was in 2017, and it was a movie about – it was like an extension of the movie Her. And so for, for the listeners, Her is about uh, this gentleman – um, not a gentleman, what's his name, um, Joaquin Phoenix, right, mm-hmm. uh, the Joker, and he uh, had developed a relationship with artificial intelligence. You're like, ah, oh, this is crazy. You know, you, you see how slowly he, he became totally enamored with his artificial intelligence. Well, okay, that passed. So yeah. in 2017, there was a movie about uh, the mother – was getting or grand, mother was getting older in her year. She was about eighty eight. She was about like eighty five, ninety, and you know she was getting to her mental faculties are starting to de- uh, deteriorate and what have you. And there was artificial intelligence where she would have conversations with her husband. Now her husband was around the age when he met her, so this was like forty, forty five years prior. And just having that conversation with him every day, you know, he he would remind her to eat and, you know, the jokes that she knew. And it, it, I think where it's going, like we're talking about, I mean, if you, if you can imagine linearly, again, as a guy, but uh, 20 years ago of Timmy or Rev or any of these other things that could transcribe with ease, with accuracy, right? right. It's only going right. to get better. And so it's like, yeah, I want to talk to grandma. And what was it like? And she would, you know, it's kind of, I'll tell you a, another story because this just happened this week and I, I didn't even post the podcast yet, but I had, um, I had dedicated the last podcast to my aunt because my aunt on Tuesday, I have podcast today, which is Sunday and then on Wednesday. So on Tuesday, my aunt, my mother's sister, had gone to the hospital to give plasma, right, because of COVID, and that seems to be the thing today, dead. right? So yeah. anyway, she goes, and then she flatlines while she's in the hospital. Oh. And oh. when she flatlined out in, in sharing the conversation, when she shared the conversation with me, she's looking at the monitor with the doctors, right? She didn't realize she flatlined. And then she, she sees her mom in the other room, and the mom's like, hey, she, I mean, we're all from, originally from New Jersey, so I would say uh, we're Eagles fans. So grandma played linebacker for the Eagles. She stopped her and was like, nope, you got to go back. You'll shoot your eye out, kid, <laughs> like the Christmas story, and sent her back. It wasn't her time. But she was like, as her daughter remembered her, and it was like, oh, okay, this is real, and I'm having this conversation with her. So uh, as I'm speaking with you and writing these letters, it could be to grandma, great-grandma that's passed, or it could be to you when you're that age. I mean, I think the sky's the limit, isn't it? That's true, and I'd like to emphasize that if you're writing a letter to someone who has passed and you are delivering it in whatever it way you have chosen to, chosen to reading it, reading it, some sort of, sort of, if, if the contents if the of that letter, of that are, not letter are not extremely private, private and that it's okay, that it's okay for that, for that relative, relative uh, descendant descendants to, to have a copy, have a give, copy. It to give it to them, because that can because become that can a part, become part of their part family, of their history, family and history and family, family legacy, about, legacy their about their ancestors. If you're into genealogy, you can appreciate how important that would be. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think from that regard, as long I think it can be a tidal wave, right? Like there's always going to be the the teacher's pet. <laughs> so there's going to be like five that'll do it. But then right. I think it kept right. on where you show how easy it could be. And I know I've been speaking in a lot of generalizations, and we spoke about you know the senior citizens and older people that need people to reach out to. But the other thing to remember is in 2020, you know, generations ago, like you said, it was 30 miles away from your family, your dad. Now we're across the country. So you have all these single people living by themselves that I'm sure will have a huge psychiatry bill when this is all over because they're, you know, it's that isolation that we're all going through. Right. It's it's quite isolated. I I have friends who are undergoing severe depression right now, but they're afraid to go out. So they've got paranoia and depression. Wow. So I think that's where the next question goes with uh, how do you determine what's private and what's public? Because it's sounds like the writing is a work in progress. Like, I, I love the scenario about, I think you said your father-in-law's mother, she had two different time periods from 1913 to 1915, and the other was the late 30s. Like, it's, uh-huh. it, it, it's interesting to, or your hope test back when you had eyes for Dreamy Johnny. It, well, we don't think well, that I way today. I still have letters in there from my first fiancé. I, I, wow. I, I don't like him like anymore. anymore. He did me <laughs> right. dirty. He did me wrong. But I still have his still letters, have letters from the better times. Better times you know? so. That was my next question, because if we move on, in this case, because uh, that's one of the issues with genealogy, right? So it, from a linear standpoint, yeah, Grandpa loved Grandma when they were, like, 15 and they were married 80 years. And my parent, My grandparents were married 60-plus. But... When we do the genealogy, we see that, okay, this was the second marriage, or this is the stepbrother, stepsister, or there was a divorce today. And so now that person no longer wants to share that information. So, you know, how far down the rabbit hole can you go as far as, I shared that with you because I thought we'd be together, and now we're not. It, it just is what it is. You've yeah. got to be accepting of whatever you encounter in that regard. That's a good point. So when I, you, I don't you, believe I don't in regret. And, yeah. and I, don't, I, don't, I also don't believe in shooting on myself or, or pointing a finger at anybody else and saying you should or should not have done something because that's the past we're in the present the present is a gift use it mm-hmm. and so the other side was you had a letter from your fiance that was hey that was the past so the present person that's reading this that's not your fiance is like why are you still holding on to that is that the conversation the letters that you were sweet. Mm. it's okay nah, it. you know you're saying we need to grow up time. You're yeah, saying we need to yeah, grow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, exactly. I, I wonder if we can wrap around to the gratitude letters again for just a moment. Sure. I'd, I'd like to make the point that there are so many occasions you can use to write those letters in my book, which is called How to Write Heartfelt Letters to Treasure for Special Occasions and Occasions Made Special. That book describes how to write 157 different types of letters oh, wow. and you know all types of occasions whether it's you know it talks about special occasions those are things like marriages and birthdays and bar mitzvahs and and you know moments of of transition in the life you know engagements uh passings and so on or occasions made special which is just because someone is special and you've decided you want to write to them and tell them. So there are all kinds of reasons to do it. And I'd like to mention that this book offers you all kinds of tools to do it with. Now, I'm not going to say it offers templates. What it has is is chapters on different things, but it's got a very powerful appendix. I talked earlier about the... Uh, 
the admirable traits that somebody has, and you're thinking, well, I know they're great, but I can't quite think how to describe it. Well, one of the appendices is 15 demographic lists of 72 powerful positive words each that are very carefully customized to that demographic. There's one for a military service member, one for someone religious or spiritual, and then there's a list for a a small child, for a teen boy, a teen girl, middle-aged man, middle-aged woman, and on up like that. So you've got 17 lists, and all you have to do is go to the one or one that apply, glimpse at the words, and jot down the ones that you think are the most powerful to apply to the person you're writing to, and that gives you a place to start. And then there are other things in the appendices that help you if you want to start or end your letter with a famous quotation that follows the theme you're writing about. Those are there, too. They're hand-picked for you. Uh, there uh, are there great are beginnings great to jumpstart your jump sentences start in case sentence. you still can't make you yourself can't put make a yourself pen, to paper pen to paper or finger to keyboard. Or finger to keyboard. Um, um, it gives you the start of a sentence, and you, sentence. Can, finish it out. you can finish it out. And it says, yeah. Oh, yeah, I could write oh, yeah, about, I that. about that. So oh, lots of lots of powerful lots tools of in that book, and I just wanted to mention it and to say that people can find more about that book at the website goodways to write dot com. So I wanted to get that word in. Oh, absolutely. And I like that it's all in one package as opposed to uh, chicken soup for the golfer or chicken soup for the teenager. (laughs) You have it all in one compact, and it helps with so many writing prompts. I'm sure uh, as a copy, you do copy editing. um, Where does this also lead? Do you... Do you find people may reach out to you? Uh, you know, it started out as this letter of appreciation. Now I have this full book that I'd like to share with the world. Is, is there a process to do that as well? Uh, there's a process, uh, there's but, a process, well, I mean, well, no one's asked me no to do that, that, let's just say. And I've been at this for a few years. years. I can imagine I can if imagine somebody is somebody wanting to write an, to write an entire memoir about, memoir about somebody who was important. Was important. Um, I know I have a I friend, know, Melissa Guzetta, Guzetta, who wrote a book called Private Lucky, Lucky about Hank Gillibard, who was born in Belgium, I believe. But he was active in World War II, and he had some amazing adventures because he always wanted to be a pilot. And this book was about how he got through so many harrowing experiences, and he eventually did get to be a pilot just because of his own determination to be one. Now, not in the war particularly, but after. Fascinating life story. And that started out as her admiration for Hank as the individual. And she ended up documenting his life story. So that's one kind of an outcome. Mm -hmm. I love it just because of we were talking earlier about paying it forward and not having any uh, any attachments. And after uh, Chadwick Boseman's passing, there was this really cool uh, story of the time when he was a broke college student. (laughs) I remember those days. Anyway, he wanted to do this theater, and he didn't have the money for it. And so this famous guy was there, and his name is Denzel Washington, and he he didn't know the student at all. He, He just put aside this money for the student. And this guy went on to, you know, do Black Panther and countless movies. So you just yeah. have no yeah. idea of these letters of appreciation of how the big of impact that it can have on someone that you, you can't even imagine. I'm, I'm just thinking of um, the stories of someone saying of getting – you said hello to them for that day. It was, it was a complete stranger, and it totally changed their whole course of how they were feeling that day. Um, it shows how we're, we're connected, and this is another yeah. way to connect with there, our fellow humans. I heard another story where there was a guy who was suicidal. He was a teenager, and he was suicidal. But on the day that he was thinking seriously about committing suicide later that day, he happened to have received a letter or a note from his dad uh, that just said how proud his dad was of him. And that mm-hmm. totally changed the boy's life. He decided he'd stick around. So that that dad changed. He saved a life, and he didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. Remarkable. I love it. And uh, from that side and to the other side, like 
I mean, we're all human and we all have mortality, but we don't know the time. And so we think right. we're always going to be here. So, um, yeah, I think these letters of appreciation are, or it could be part of your, your uh, not daily, but something that you constantly come back to. And, and I, I think that it, it, it makes the heart lighter too, just kind of getting these thoughts out on paper, even if you didn't Absolutely. send that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the the idea is, you know, you've heard over and over again, people who go to their deathbeds, they don't want to go with regrets. So if mm-hmm. you imagine, I mean, don't don't be the young person that thinks, I'm going to live forever. The fact is you won't. The fact is you don't know when you're going to go. And therefore, live each day to the fullest and try to end each day with no regrets. Now, if you end up having a regret that you didn't write or tell so-and-so that they were so special in the world or in your life, um, put that on your list to take care of very, very soon so it won't be on your regrets list on the day you die. Just have a clean slate every day. I think that is fantastic uh, a way to live. I think the the last thing I'm, I was thinking of, I'm a big fan of people laugh at me, but leave it to Beaver. And so with everyone being in the house, I, I've seen families with the dad, you know, walking in the evening. And mm-hmm. it makes mm-hmm. it a time like to be Ward Cleaver-ish, if you will. And during these family meetings, have this type of conversation. And then the kids usually follow the parents. So if the parents are doing this, then the kids, will naturally start following at an early age and it may it may be something like a family tradition in the future right i think it's something you can do on thanksgiving too is to just draw names out of a hat of everybody who's going to be at the thanksgiving dinner and write a letter or a card or just some little something to to the person whose name you've drawn to say that you're really you know know, special special in what way in what way Wow. Yeah, I, li- I like that, too, especially this year <laughs> with yes. with yes. everything going on, for sure. And I'm, it, it still feels like we've only scratched the, the surface with everything that you can provide and, and being heartfelt and expressing gratitude. Uh, you did mention your website, but are there social media or do you do speaking engagements uh, virtually and in the near future in person, uh, please share all that information now for people that want to get in touch with you. Yes, I'd yes, like you, I'd to, like you uh, to, uh, to be aware, be that, aware I'm, that I'm offering, I'm offering workshops, workshops through the Museum, through the museum, museum, museum and Community and Center, and Center in Anaheim, and, Anaheim, and, and these are now these being, are done, now being virtually. done virtually. The next one the that's slated is... Sunday, Sunday, November 8th, from 1 to 2.15 Pacific time, so that would be 4 to 5.15 Eastern. It's not yet promoted, but it will be soon. I'd like to share my email address if you'd like me to contact you later on when the details are up there, or you can watch for Museo, M-U-Z-E-O dot org. I watch for their events section in about three weeks. I think you'll find the promotion up there. But my email address is Lynette, L-Y-N-E-T-T-E, at, at goodways2write.com. And if anybody out there also would like to know anything about my book editing or book layout proofreading services, I have a separate website for that. That is allmybest.com. And plenty of details are available there. My full contact information is available on both of those websites, goodwaystowrite.com, about letter writing, allmybest.com about copy editing and proofreading. And with that, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza and Lynette. It was I want to express my gratitude for having you on the podcast today, and let's stay in touch. Thank you, and I'm grateful to you for having me here. Thank you so much. Uh-huh.